There we go. All right, fantastic. Welcome everybody. My name is Craig Tucker. Uh, I am uh, assisting the Klamath River Renewal Corporation today and sharing some really outstanding information. Um, I know it's still Mark Branson's thunder, but I, I do feel the need to, to announce that we have broken ground on the world's biggest salmon restoration project to date. And as most of you all know, uh, this can't come a moment too soon. Uh, recent news stories have been circulating about how dismal the forecast for salmon will be this year in California. Uh, I expect there will be a near total closure of all commercial and recreational fishing in the ocean this year. We expect there to be near total closures of commercial, tribal, and uh, recreational fishing uh, in the Klamath River and similar in Sacramento system. So salmon are in dire straits and projects like this are exactly what we need. We're gonna have three folks share more information with you. We have Mark Bransom. He's the uh, CEO of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. We have uh, Dave Kaufman. He is the Northern California, Oregon D Director of Operations for RES. I think I probably mangled your job title a bit there, Dave, but it's in the press release and you can correct me uh, when it's your turn to speak. And off camera, but who will be popping in is uh, uh, Wendy Ferris. Uh, Wendy is a descendant of the Krug tribe. She's the Krug tribe's appointee to the Klamath River Renewal Corporation Board of Directors. And she'll also talk a little bit about how important this moment is for uh, folks in the Klamath Basin who have been working for this for, for, for decades. So I think what I'll do is let everyone um, share their piece of the story with all of you. And then, uh, then we'll have questions kind of at the end. And I'll try to, we'll try to field questions just from having folks use the hand raise function. And so I've asked folks to speak three or four minutes and then that'll give us uh, the balance of the hour for questions and answers with the media. So that's, that's how we're gonna do it. So I wanna start without further ado, introducing Mark Branson. Mark, tell us uh, about yourself, tell us about your position and tell us about the big news today. Yeah, Craig, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Appreciate everyone taking a little time to join this morning and hear a little bit about the uh, the kickoff of uh, the Klamath River Dam removal and restoration work. Uh, as Craig said, we have broken ground uh, and be assured, Craig, that there is plenty of thunder to go around so we can all uh, acknowledge that the work is underway and uh, and celebrate the moment. And on behalf of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, uh, we just remain honored to stand on the shoulders of the tribes and the conservation community and the fishermen's organizations and those who have been working diligently over the past several decades to bring us to the point where we are actually now underway with the uh, decommissioning of the Lower Klamath Hydroelectric Project. Uh, so um, this project, as, as most of you know, includes the removal of four dams and the hydroelectric pertinent facilities, powerhouses, canals, and the like. Uh, these four dams include the 173-foot-tall Iron Gate Dam, the 225-foot-tall Copco No. 1 Dam, the itty-bitty 35-foot-tall Copco No. 2 Diversion Dam, and the 76-foot-tall J.C. Boyle Dam up in Oregon. Uh, this project, of course, is much, much more than just the dam removal. This is also a restoration project that will ultimately return about 38 miles of the Klamath River through the hydroelectric project reach uh, to a free-flowing, more natural condition. And uh, the restoration work is every bit as important as removing these dams. Uh, and uh, my friend and colleague Dave Kaufman from Res will be speaking about that a little bit more. Uh, after I talk about uh, some of the highlights of where we are and where we're going on the dam removal. We will be sharing an infographic um, with you. I believe it was in the press packet, uh, and it will uh, lay out for you some of the, the schedule highlights, but um, <clears throat> let me just hit on a few of those right now. Um, and and we, just, so everybody know, I did drop the link to this infographic hmm. in the chat so people can follow along with Mark. Yeah, thanks, Greg, for doing that. 
So we broke ground uh, on March 10th after giving Keywood Infrastructure West, our dam removal contractor, an expanded notice to proceed to allow them to get started. This came on the heels of, um, of a partial approval, a partial authorization from FERC, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, that came uh, March 7th that allowed us to uh, undertake some of the early construction work. Um, just in broad terms, we will be spending the rest of 2023 on the early enabling construction projects to prepare us for initiation of drawdown of the reservoirs and then removal of the dams beginning in January of 2024. So the work that's currently underway and will get underway here in the coming months includes the construction of access roads to allow us to bring in the heavy construction equipment. Uh, we will be doing some reinforcement of some existing bridges that the construction equipment will be utilizing, as well as the construction of some new bridges uh, in the area, both for construction purposes, but also for longer term uh, use uh, by local residents and, and others that will be um, moving through the area. Uh, we're in the process of developing uh, several sites to accommodate the workforce uh, installing job trailers and uh, office space, as well as um, uh, lodging facilities, uh, uh, RV park uh, type facilities for the construction crews. Uh, in the May timeframe, we will get started on the construction of a new water supply line for the city of Wairika. Uh, that water line currently sits uh, at the bottom of Iron Gate Reservoir. Uh, and we need to get that water line relocated before we draw the reservoirs down and restore the, the uh, river to a free flowing condition. So we'll be lifting that, uh, that water line out and replacing it with a new uh, water line that will be suspended uh, over a new bridge across the, the main stem of the, the Klamath River. Uh, starting in roughly the June timeframe and extending through probably September of this year, uh, we will be removing the, the small diversion dam, COPCO number two. It's the smallest of the dams, as I mentioned, but for a variety of uh, engineering and construction reasons, uh, it makes sense to get in and remove that structure first. As I mentioned then, beginning in early uh, uh, 2024, January of 2024, we will initiate the drawdown of the reservoirs and then the removal of the dams. Uh, we will utilize some new uh, low-level outlet works uh, that we will be constructing this summer uh, to draw the reservoirs down to, to flush out the, the water and, and the accumulated sediment behind Boyle, Copco Number 1, and Iron Gate Dam. And then we will utilize some of the original diversion tunnel works uh, that were uh, constructed when the dams were originally built uh, so that we can redirect the river around the construction site to allow us for the removal of the facilities in a dry river channel. So our schedule uh, has us removing all four of the dams uh, and restoring the Klamath River to a free flowing condition uh, through the hydroelectric reach by the end of 2024. Uh, the restoration work will begin in 2024 and then continue well beyond that period. Uh, and you'll hear more about that. So Craig, let me stop there and turn it back to you to get us to uh, discussion about the restoration activities. Thanks, Mark. I'm sure people have more questions about the timing sequence and all that stuff uh, here in a little bit. But I do want to introduce uh, Dave Kaufman. Uh, Dave is the guy who brings the yellow iron to the project, as he likes to say. So, so Dave, introduce yourself to folks and talk a little bit about, you know, we we're talking about this as not as the a dam removal project, but a salmon restoration project. So it's more than just dam removal. So share that with folks. Uh, we'll be interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Uh, for uh, again, Dave Kaufman, Director of Operations for Res Northern California and Southern Oregon. You were so close. Um, I'll take the whole state, though. It's fine. The uh, you know we're here and excited, and you'll you notice my surroundings are fairly bleak. This is a brand new office trailer uh, near the project that where we're we're staging, jumping off, and um, really diving in, um, super neat project, very exciting time, very fast pace and just feeling right at home. So uh, again, thanks everybody for coming together, uh, giving an opportunity or provide an opportunity to, to share information. For those of you who, who know me, I get fairly long-winded uh, talking about restoration. I will do my best to keep things brief, but um, 
You know, Kiwit uh, just broke ground on dam removal. We've been on the ground working restoration, preparing for restoration for uh, since 2019. Uh, we've had, had tr our tribal partners have been on site collecting seed uh, that will that fruit plants that will provide the foundation for um, reservoir sediment stabilization following dam removal, right? And like Craig mentioned and Mark alluded to, um, this is a salmon restoration uh, project. And the first step, and uh, very importantly, the most important step to salmon restoration on the Klamath River is removal of these dams. Uh, but dam removal can be a, a little bit of a messy business. So we're here to um, get reservoir sediment stabilized through uh, reestablishment of native vegetation. Um, provide some immediate high quality habitat for returning salmonids as they uh, make their way through former dam footprints and into uh, river channels where they haven't been in over 100 years. And, um, and really jumpstart the recovery of this landscape um, that you know, will take a few years to decades, uh, but we're gonna be here to get using you know, yellow iron as one tool that Craig mentioned. Um, to really get things moving in the right direction in a, in a rapid way. And then uh, res in and of itself, we're here uh, to, to watch over and steward the landscape within these reservoir footprints and surrounding areas to make sure this restoration is successful and we'll, we'll be here until it is. Um, you know, so, so like I mentioned, we've been collecting seed. We're somewhere in the ballpark of 17 billion seeds, native seeds, all um, either sourced directly from the Klamath Basin or sourced from plants that were grown from seeds that were sourced from the Klamath Basin. And um, you know, I just got to move, I, I was already impressed when I got to move a, a 2,000 pound pallet of seed the other day down here on our project site. We're, we're moving things into to cold storage, getting ready for planting. Um, and then I'm told, oh, this is just one of, you know, 50 pallets. You know, I, and, tons and tons literally of seed uh, coming onto the project site. We've partnered with local farms um, up and down the west coast to, to grow these these native plants to provide the seed and then again just collecting We're, we continue to collect seed um, to plant directly into the reservoir footprints um, and surrounding areas. So reservoir footprint restoration is, is a big component and as I mentioned immediate restoration of some priority tributaries namely um, Camp Creek and Scotch Creek, Jenny Creek, Beaver Creek, and uh, Spencer Creek, uh, immediately providing some high quality salmonid habitat, right? So getting into these tributaries, doing some bank grading, adding habitat features through wood and rock and supplementing bed sediment where necessary to provide spawning gravels and really opening up, uh, in the case of Spencer Creek, nearly 20 miles of uh, available habitat upstream of uh, J.C. Wool Reservoir, right? So we've got maybe 1,500 feet of, of work to do at Spencer Creek uh, from a, a restoration construction perspective, but to, to, it's really important. We're going to unlock, you know, an amount of salmon habitat, high quality habitat that, like I mentioned, hasn't been available to these fish for over 100 years. Um, and hopefully they're as excited as we are to get back in there. Um, and so, uh, it is, it, it is a big project. It's a, um, it's a complicated undertaking and one that we're just thrilled to be a part of. And Craig, I'll, I'll turn back to you and i um, happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Dave, th thanks a bunch. And just to let, to let make sure everyone knows the removing these dams is gonna free up, we think around 400 miles of, this is main stem Klamath, all the creeks and tributaries that mm -hmm. fish historically used. To the climate, so it's it's a pretty significant uh, increase in what's available habitat for fish to spawn for juveniles to rear, and there's a lot of cold water up there above the dams because it's a spring-fed system up there. So we can talk more about that as people have questions. I want to introduce uh, Wendy Ferris. Wendy, are you? Can you turn on your camera? Um, so I've known I've known Wendy for for a lot of years uh, on this uh, effort to remove dams in the Klamath River, and I've just asked her to talk a little bit with a tribal perspective about what this moment means for folks um, who have really been championing this for for decades and fighting tooth and nail for this for decades. So, Wendy, just introduce yourself and I'll share your story with us. 
Thank you, Craig. I'd like to say thank you to the Kirk tribe for appointing me to the KRC board. Um, I've been involved in the project since the beginning of the board um, exist their existence. And it's been a trying time for native people. Unfortunately, uh, this restoration project has been the works for several decades. And for tribal people, um, it's really hard to sum up in three minutes uh, what this project means to them. Unfortunately, uh, and it's often that many people have a hard time understanding the connection of the Native American person and the land and why it is so important to us and why, why we feel we have a higher connection uh, with the land and a responsibility to protect it. And so uh, just to give you a little history for those who are not familiar, uh, you know, the tribes who belong to the basin, the Klamath River Basin, they have been in existence for thousands of years. And so when contact did happen, uh, unfortunately the land, the majority of the land was removed from their uh, management and the type of management that they had um, been through oral teachings. And so through time they were placed on reservations and their land was shrunk uh, to very small land bases, which didn't allow them to practice their religion uh, fully to the fullest extent. And when I say practice the religion, what I mean by that is uh, the land is the Bible of the people, the native people. So the rules of their religion lie within those plants, creeks, rivers, animals, and all living things around them. So that connection to them and restoring that land base was um, a type of agreement of us being here in this physical place, living on this land. We all each individually as tribes had our own language and have our own language today. But in that language are the lessons that we were provided in order to maintain and manage and live in balance. And so when we talk about what does restoring this river system mean, it's, it's basically the first phase of bringing back our religion to a healthy state and being able to have healthy people and live in balance. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing that. And I'm sure you'll be available for questions folks may have. So I think we're just gonna ask, uh, see if folks wanna ask questions and, and dig deeper on anything we've talked about. And we'll just ask folks to use the hand raise function. And I think, Ren, you have the, um, the piloting controls for uh, for calling on people. <clears throat> oh, and, and while and while you're, you're doing that, I will. Uh, it's in the uh, the press release that we circulated this morning. But I'm going to drop the YouTube link to the new film "Reconnecting Klamath." Um, Restoring it, balance. It, I mean, I'm sorry. Restoring balance. I, I'm, Restoring Balance, it was produced by Rez, and it does go into some detail and tell this story, the seed collection stories in there, but it talks a little bit about the restoration approach uh, for how we're going to put this Reach a River back together. So I'll drop that in there, but if folks have questions, raise hands, and Ren, you can call on folks. Hi there. Um, I just got unmuted. Um, I have a question, and I'm still a little unclear uh, about what it means to break ground. Um, what exactly has happened that uh, I can describe in a story? Yeah, Cassandra, thanks for the question. So uh, I think that the the main things that um, are currently underway include the uh, construction of the access roads, the the reinforcement uh, of uh, some of the existing bridges. The, you can iron your clothes. There, there is work underway also at the Fall Creek Hatchery. That's not a Klamath River Renewal Corporation project, but it is certainly related to the dam removal work. Uh, that is a, an, a project that is being done to ensure that by the time we draw the reservoir down at Iron Gate, uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, transferred the hatchery operations over to the new hatchery facility at, uh, at Fall Creek Hatchery. So this is a lot about laying the, laying the groundwork and positioning things to get the, um, the work, uh, uh, the modifications to the dams, uh, the removal and relocation of the uh, City of Wairika waterline, 
uh, and a variety of other um, projects done to facilitate the, the drawdown and the removal beginning in 2024. Dave, do you want to add anything on the restoration side uh, to Cassandra's question? Yeah, certainly. The, on the restoration side, not so much breaking ground. I, we did plant some trees last month, uh, which was pretty exciting. We had uh, some some Klamath plum that were ready to go in the ground sooner than, than the project was quite ready for them. But what we were able to do was leverage some areas where we've been doing work to manage invasive species around Iron Gate Reservoir. Um, we had some some native seed that was ready to go down, so that was planted last fall, and then we, we put some some Klamath plum facilitation patches in the ground um, earlier this month. And so I would say, yeah, we we officially broken ground too on the restoration, not just um, trying to knock back star thistle, but also starting to plant some of that native vegetation that that if and when successful will provide a local seed source uh, for spreading uh, good things into the reservoir footprints. Thank you. Yep. I see Dan Bacher's hand up. Dan, you've you've been coding this story a long time. Ask your question. Okay. What is the plan for for fish removal or dealing with with the fish and the wildlife that are behind the dams? Um, Iron Gate is um, has you know millions of perch and thousands of, of bass, crappie. Um, um, has uh, trout, which are our landlocked steelhead, and will reconnect. But what what is is there going to be a removal of those fish, and are they going to be put in another lake in California, or what's going to happen? Because um, you know, there's just lots of fish, and, and there's lots of fish up also, uh, also the same species up in Copco. Yeah, Dan, the um, the uh, emphasis uh, will be on um, on native uh, species uh, per the regulators. We're going to focus on uh, an effort to uh, collect and relocate suckers. That'll be the the primary focus. Uh, we've got a couple of locations: one in California, one in Oregon, where um, suckers that are uh, that are collected from Boyle and Copco, and I think there is some at Iron Gate as well, uh, will be um, uh, translocated to these um, to these new locations. So that that's going to be the the focus of um, of recovery and relocation efforts for um, for fish that are in the reservoirs. Res is responsible for for that effort. So let me see if Dave wants to to add anything more to that. Not a requirement that he do so, but um, uh, opportunity, Dave, if you want to elaborate on, on that at all. I, I told you, Mark, I'll talk about this stuff all day long. Uh, so <laughs> the, the sucker work coming up, I would say, is probably other than the seed collection and invasive species, you know, IEV invasive exotic vegetation management work we've been doing is, is our our first real big um, high level of activity that we're gonna see starting in less than a month. Uh, we'll have boats and crews working 24 hours a day. Uh, right now, depending on weather, starting in uh, Oregon on JC Bull Lake or JC Bull Reservoir, then moving down river to Copco Lake and, and Iron Gate Reservoir. Um, trapping, uh, collecting data on pit tagging and then translocating in cooperation with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Klamath tribes. Um, Schwam and Koptu from those lakes to holding uh, existing holding and rearing facilities with um, the intent being that these fish add to the existing broodstock in those facilities to provide um, you know eggs juveniles for reintroduction efforts in the upper basin. And it, is it fair to say that some of these game fish like um, perch and bass you know, those fish are already washing downstream in the river, but they just don't make it, right? The, the river environment, it's colder, the moving water, they just don't do well. And so the expectation is a lot of those fish probably won't make it over time. Um, our next uh, person is B Toasty. Hi. Hi, Greg, thanks. Um, I have a question about the seeds uh, used to restore the the reservoir footprints. I'm just curious if um, y'all anticipate having enough native seeds 
to be able to do that over the over the course of the years of restoration and um, what the strategies are to uh, to make sure that you have the volume of seeds necessary for that. Great question. Again, kind of complicated, pretty big project. So what we do have is a very robust seed yield increase project ongoing and that will continue, right? So this, the activities, why well, I said we started Resource Environmental Solutions started on it in 2019. Um, predecessors of ours started the process in 2018. And so we've been working on this now for four, coming up on year number five and have no intention of slowing down the, the seed collection and yield increase activities. Uh, we currently have uh, nearly enough seed in uh, coming out of this year, especially with the wet spring we've had, coming out of this year, we will have enough seed to see to, to reseed the reservoir footprints twice at the uh, densities needed to, to, to get native vegetation a foothold in the reservoir sediments and, and begin recovering. Um, one of the other neat things that we've seen that gives us a lot of optimism for this process is that um, there's a huge source of native seed bank within reservoir sediments already. Um, Iron Gate, Copco Reservoirs, and JC Bull are surrounded by existing wetland plant communities that produce seeds every year and drop those seeds into water. They sink, they sit in reservoir sediments. And what we see during maintenance uh, modifications of water levels in the reservoirs is that those wetland seeds grab hold and start growing. So we immediately have a native seed bank that will provide seed uh, to get that transition from reservoir sediment to soil started. We'll then be laying down seed. And we fully expect that some areas, the seed's gonna take hold and grow super successfully. In other areas, maybe not. Um, that's when adaptive management comes in and we uh, potentially modify the type of seed being placed. We modify the, the density of seed, the timing of planting, um, localized irrigation if necessary, soil amendments if needed, all these different things, these tools in our toolbox to make sure we get successful establishment of uh, vegetation across the 2200 approximately acres of exposed reservoir sediment. And Dave, I think it's fair to say that we have a, a landscape scale uh, plant propagation program well underway. Not only have you all uh, uh, been collecting native seed from, uh, you know, on the ground, but you've been working with a number of, of nurseries who are utilizing some of that seed uh, to grow additional plants to help ensure that we have sufficient plant uh, uh, material to accomplish um, all the planned restoration, including uh, coming back and doing uh, replanting and touching up and things as may be necessary as we you know move into this over the coming several years. So big, big, big program, landscape scale, nursery operations and the like. One more thing to add, Mark, that you, you, you reminded me of is those landscape scale nursery operations, projects of this magnitude, restoration projects of this magnitude um, are rarely able to be captured fully by existing uh, commercial operations. And what this this project has done is given those operations that were in existence the ability to expand their footprints and their capabilities um, to be able to produce more seed, uh, and not just for this project, but for future projects. So this project in an indirect way will benefit future restoration projects in the Pacific Northwest. That, that story is told really nicely in the Restoring Balance film. and. It, it kind of it kind of blows me away that you guys collected a few thousand native seeds and propagated them into something like 17 billion seeds. So it's it's a it's a Herculean effort. Um, but I think it's just kind of this is how we do this and make sure that we don't just create a patch of star thistle after we remove the dams. We put it back the way it's supposed to be. So I see uh, Ryan Burns with your hand up. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Craig. Uh, thanks. I, I think maybe you've addressed this in other venues, but is there any concern about the release of accumulated sediment from behind the dams uh, on on the uh, you know the uh, ecosystem downriver? Yeah, Ryan. Good question, and I'll address that a uh, little bit, and then uh, Dave or others can can uh, offer additional perspective. But uh, let me be real clear that. This is a, a thoroughly evaluated component of the project because of the significant amount of accumulated sediment. I mean, let's not forget that uh, 
you know, these dams have been choking sediment for a hundred years. And so we've we've taken a very, very close look at the drawdown of the reservoirs and the mobilization and transport of sediment through the through the system all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. This will be a very controlled release. I mean, we are uh, designing and constructing the facilities that will allow us to draw the reservoirs down in a manner that will ensure that we don't create any overbank flooding condition or, or the like. So it'll be a very controlled drawdown. But the significant presence of the sediment itself will certainly have some impacts. This is why the regulators and the tribes and others that we've worked with have directed us to undertake this effort during the winter. So starting in January and extending out through about the end of March, when we have sort of the least biological activity in the in the river, that, that winter period gives us the least biological activity and the highest probability of higher flows uh, should we, you know, need those uh, to to help us mobilize and and push that sediment through the system? We certainly acknowledge that this is going to have a significant impact on water quality parameters, but I'll just leave you with one additional data point, and that is that the roughly, you know, five to seven million uh, cubic yards of material that we expect will move down through the system. The majority of that is very fine sediment. Uh, is is about equivalent to what the the Klamath River handles in terms of sediment transport volume every year anyway. So we're going to be putting it in in about three to four months, maybe four to five months by the time we're all done with it. Uh, so a shorter period of time. But in the broader context of what the Klamath River is accustomed to handling with regard to sediment, again, it's about an annual uh, uh, transport volume amount. Uh, so not a uh, an undue amount. And again, a very controlled management of that uh, release and transport. Dave, anything else you you would add to that? I, you know, you hit all the topics that I typically do, Mark, which is fine grain, um, somewhat acute release of sediment that because it's fine grain and the, there is natural variability in the flows of the Klamath River throughout the year, we should see a pretty complete transport of that material uh, into the areas that need it. Uh, keep in mind that when Mark mentioned Sediment's been being trapped for the past hundred years. That means sediment's not been available for the past hundred years either. So there's areas where that fine grain sediment will help the system downstream. Um, there, there will be an impact, but we and the, the regulatory agencies also believe that impact to be fairly short-lived. The impact may be short-lived, but we have committed to long-term monitoring too, just to Correct. make sure. And we stand ready to address any uh, any issues that may result from deposition or uh, any concerns that anybody may have. Our monitoring will extend all the way out into the ocean because we do want to ensure that uh, the sediment falls into the natural uh, transport mechanisms uh, in the ocean uh, and that we don't see that sediment showing up in you know significant volumes in any uh, infrastructure like uh, harbors or anything like that. So we will be doing long-term monitoring on the sediment. Right on. Um, let's see, I don't see anyone's hand. Does anybody else have any questions for this esteemed panel? People second to find their hand button. They're looking for it. You can certainly, anybody wants to talk to these folks or any of the other uh, experts in the various fields. Oh, I see Mark Rockwell with your hand up. Thanks, Craig. I just thought it might be <clears throat> it might be interesting for press to hear about what's being planned for the hatchery uh, at Iron Gate. Yeah, I can touch on that uh, quickly, Mark. As I mentioned before, the the construction at the Fall Creek Hatchery is not a Klamath River Renewal Corporation project. This is a project that is required under the uh, terms of the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement and therefore is uh, related to, to the dam removal and restoration work, but is, is, a, is a project that's being administered by uh, Pacific Corp, uh, the former owner of the dams, as well as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, those parties, uh, along with signatories to the settlement agreement, uh, have, um, have agreed that uh, Hatchery operations will extend for a minimum of eight years with uh, funding for those uh, operations and maintenance of the hatchery facility provided by Pacific Corp. CDFW will uh, own and operate the, the uh, Fall Creek facility, uh, and, uh, and that is intended to, you know, sort of provide 
at least um, you know hatchery stock uh, and uh, releases for you know that period of of, uh, of eight years. And beyond that, it will be up to uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to determine uh, sort of long-term uh, needs and requirements, uh, most certainly with input from a, a wide group of, of uh, partners. Um, so as I uh, mentioned in, in my earlier comments, when we initiate the drawdown of uh, Iron Gate in beginning in January of 2024, we will uh, fairly quickly hit the water supply uh, elevation in the reservoir uh, for the Iron Gate hatchery. So in advance of that, we need to ensure that we have uh, alternative um, hatchery operations, and that's the purpose behind uh, the construction work at uh, uh, that's currently underway at Fall Creek. Excellent. Um, Marcel Calfat, I see your hand up. Yep, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for doing this. Very interesting. I work for TV, so I'm just wondering two things. What kind of access would we have uh, in order to go and do a TV story on this? And and second question, when would be the best time visually to go? Yeah, good question, Marcel. Uh, Mark, Mark Bransom with the Renewal Corporation. Um, we have established a whole series of uh, procedures and protocols uh, that will provide for access. There will be uh, some limitations. Of course, we have a very active uh, construction site, so safety is a paramount consideration. But um, if you'll drop us a line, uh, we will put you in touch with the uh, entity that is uh, handling all of the necessary uh, uh, procedures and protocols to ensure that media and others will have access. And we can talk about timing. Uh, as I said, you know, drawdown of the reservoirs and and real uh, the, the, the removal of the big dams starting in the spring, early summer of next year. Uh, so a lot of good visuals will be occurring, you know, in that time period for sure. Thank you. And dropping the line, just send a note to Craig or? Who yeah, that'd be fine. It? Craig can get it to me or uh, I think okay. my contact information is also in the press information. Uh, Mark okay. Bransom, Mark at KlamathRenewal.org. Happy to um, facilitate a connection. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have anything while you've got these <clears throat> folks? Um, yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot, Wendy, but um, I want to make sure everyone gets to hear from you. Maybe you want to wind things out uh, or wrap things up a bit uh, as we finish this up. Thank you, Craig. I think it's really important that we recognize the sacrifices that tribes have made along the way. Uh, tribes do not have an, um, a stream of funds uh, that really support the type of uh, battle that and strain that this um, really restorative justice project has put on them. We, uh, you know, really take and use all of the resources we have to hire attorneys and to form coalitions to um, be able to put our culture, our people in the forefront for the long run. So our, our overall goal um, of restoring this river is really, we're going to see the outcome and the benefits of it long into the future. But for right now, we've lost so many people along the way throughout this battle, throughout this fight. And so it's really important for us as tribal people to recognize those who have fought and who have held us together. And Craig Tucker, you're one of those people who um, they helped form all the alliances. And we talk about this now, you know, the how the stars really all had to line up uh, throughout the last, you know, 20 plus years of, of working towards making this project actually happen. And so the stars did line up and there were so many turns and twists in this road and so many hurdles to get over. And all the key people were in the right place. All the tribal people were in the right place. Governments came and went and elected officials came and went and um, activists came and went. And although many of them are gone now, we've been able to accomplish this huge victory. And so it's, it's really uh, fortunate that we get to see the winter storms bring the type of weather that it has this, this winter, because that was one of the last stars to lining this project up and making it successful was making sure that we had the water, the reservoirs were fuller, 
Uh, we had a snowpack, even though we don't have, um, they don't meet the exact needs that we are, you know, desiring, um, we're getting closer. And so there's a much higher power watching over this project. And we know that because uh, we really needed the, the water and the snow this year and it came. And there's a lot of things along this path that really lined up and had any one of those um, conversations veered, you know, maybe we don't, wouldn't be here today, but we are. And so I want to recognize that. I want to recognize the tribal people who have suffered and uh, they lose their fishery again uh, this spring and winter. But, you know, tribal people are one of the indigenous groups that are used to the suffrage. And I think it's time to um, really recognize how much effort those tribal people have put forth uh, to make this project happen. And I, and along with all tribal people are thankful for the scientists and activists outside of the tribes who support us, who work with us and federal agency directors who have had our back along this process. Um, without those key people being in key positions, we probably wouldn't be here today either. So individuals like Chuck Bonham and many who they've lost along the way also during this fight. So I'm grateful, we are grateful for all of the people involved in this project and look forward to having an environment, an ecosystem that is healthy and thriving down the road in the future. Thank you. Yo toi, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Wendy. I really appreciate you sh sharing that. Um, Mark Ransom, thank you for sharing all this great information and um, doing so much hard work to get us to where we are today. And then uh, Dave, we're gonna thank you for the work you're gonna be doing uh, from here on out till we get this project right. Um, thanks everybody for showing up. If you have any questions, certainly call me. I can put you in contact with these speakers or um, anyone else who might be the right person to answer the question you have. Everyone have a wonderful day and I hope to talk to you all again very soon. Thank, thank you. you.